Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Ecom Edge, the first e commerce podcast focused on how enterprise brands, manufacturers, and teams like yours are using data and technology to gain that very important competitive edge. We just released our annual holiday report where we surveyed 4,000 consumers, and a healthy 80% of them said they anticipate spending the same or more as last year. Yet when we look at the front pages, all we hear is the economy is doing poorly. My guest, Alex Kantrowitz, host and founder of the Big Technology Podcast and author of the Big Technology Newsletter and on-air contributor for CNBC, is here to help us make sense of all this and give retailers like you an idea of how you can manage the volatility this season and what you should be looking to do to set yourself up for New Year. I'm Diane Burley, and this is the Ecom Edge brought to you by Coveo. Alex, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Diane. Always great to be here with the Ecom Edge. Let's yeah, do it. Let's do it. So, um, a little volatility out there in the market. What are you, what are you seeing, and uh, how crazy is it? Well, I would say volatility is a very optimistic way to look at it. It's a downright contraction that we're going through. The S and P five hundred on any given day over the past few weeks has been down anywhere between twenty to twenty three percent. It's a massive drawback, and truly a valuation correction that's happening. You know, across basically every single industry that had this massive bump uh, over over the COVID era and now is really falling back to earth. So uh, it's tough times out there in the market. And the, the volatility is, when the volatility is between being down 25% and being down 15%, uh, you, you know things are have, have gone wrong in a big way. So so how are how is it that when we interview consumers and they say, hey, yeah, we're planning on shopping as normal, how does that square with uh, with what you we're seeing with this? Well, I think it all, yeah, it's a great question, and it's all about context, right? So remember, the S and P five hundred was up thirty two percent in twenty twenty one. So okay, up thirty two percent, down twenty five percent, still leaves you up seven percent if you were invested over two years. Um, the people that are getting hurt now are the folks who just came in at the end of this bull run, um, and remember, the bull run's been for twelve years. So I do think that you know people are still feeling better off than they were before COVID, um, somehow um, at least at least economically, um, socially who knows right? Um, but economically, people are still feeling good there. And, and when it comes to consumer behavior, um, habits are really tough to break, and people got in the habits uh, of spending a lot of money over the course of COVID, um, and uh, especially spending on things. And that doesn't seem to be slowing down, which is why inflation has been so stubborn. Well, I think one of the things that's, that's been uh, taking a beating are restaurants. So if you're not going out to dinner, you know, you, you can spend on things. So I don't, I don't know if that's playing in a part of it at all. That's what that, that happened during COVID, right? That, that spending on restaurants and travel drew down. But right now, I'm pretty sure we're seeing record spending on uh, entertainment, restaurants, and especially travel. We have this concept of revenge travel that everybody's trying to make up for the time they lost staying at home. And uh, and now it's tough to get flights, which we see that in the volume at the airports. It's tough to get seats at restaurants. Maybe that's tailed off a bit because we had that early surge once we got vaccines out there and, and restrictions lifted, and those have been gone for a while now. Um but but yeah, I would say right now experiences are the thing that's that's really surging. So one of the things that um, the stats that jump out at me is that uh, customer cost of acquisition has gone up um, since 2018, up 60 percent. Markdowns are 80 uh, percent. They're up 80 percent. Returns are up 100 um, percent. It's not very sustainable, and it's certainly not uh, going to lead to profitability with those types of numbers. Um, is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, I think that again, everything has become more competitive now, right. and uh, and people have um, people know they have more power than they used to before, right? They just had more more money in their pocket. Um, unemployment is as close to full as I think you'll ever see it, um, and um, there's a renewed vigor among folks to really make sure their choices count. I think the days of Maybe before the pandemic, a lot of us were on autopilot and, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, so no judgment there. But I think <laughs> we've taken autopilot off and that's why I, the stuff that you talk about returns being up, you know, it being more expensive to uh, bring a customer in. You know, a lot of this makes sense when you have a renewed autonomy, um, you know, in the individual in a way that, 
you know, we, we saw before COVID, but, you know, certainly exploded after. You are also the author of a book. It's been out a couple of years now, but um, always day one, how the tech titans plan to stay on top forever. And um, the title's interesting. The title's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was a, a inspired, I guess, perhaps by a Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos mantra. It's always day one. Maybe you can share a little bit about that and because then I have a follow-up question about that. That's right. Yeah. So, so it is inspired by Bezos. And by the way, the subtitle is holding up pretty well. This Tech Titans plan to stay on top forever. They're still on top. So, so far, so good in terms of the accuracy of that one. So, where did the Always Day One title come from? Well, you know, I had heard the uh, reputation that Amazon had of being a hard-driving boss, and even in their leadership principles that they have, the th values that guide the company. Um, holding each other to really high standards has always been super important. And when I thought about always day one, I just imagined this was another way to say, okay, work hard and, you know, come in every day as, it, as it's your first, meaning that if you, you know, kind of um, slack off just a bit, you're, you're now in trouble. You're in day two and you're in trouble. Um, and there's this great moment where uh, there's uh, Jeff Bezos stands in front of the Amazon employee base in 2017. And so he gets a question from one of the employees written on a note card. And the question is, what does day two look like? And Bezos says, what does day two look like? And like gives this kind of mean stare out to the audience. Everyone starts laughing. And he says it's something like, you know, um, stasis, you know, followed by slow, painful decline, followed by irrelevance, followed by death. And he pauses and he says, and that's why it's always day one. And he closes the meeting. And, you know, I think that part of Amazon, of course, they work hard, but there's definitely a deeper meaning to this. Um, and the best thing about being a company on your first day on day one is that you can build the right product for the market um, without any regard for maintaining the products that you've built in the past. And you just need to focus on, you know, keeping your flagship product up. So if you're operating as if it's your day one, the question is, I don't care what is bringing home, you know, the money right now. What is going to be the product that the market needs today um, and into the future? And how do we build that? How do we take the resources that used to go towards maintaining and, and put them towards inventing and building? Um, and a lot of big companies, the truth is they don't get there, right? They spend all their time maintaining their flagship product. And that's why they're so easily disrupted. And so the theme throughout the entire book is looking at these tech giants and saying, how have they become so good at seeing what the needs of the market tomorrow and the day after that are going to be, and then structuring their companies in a way that they're able to actually build those new products and experiences that people are going to want and not just get sucked into the process of preservation that so many companies do and eventually fall apart. And if you think about it, for every single one of these big tech companies, you have seen the process of them reinventing themselves over and over and over again to meet the market. I mean, look at Amazon alone, right? Started as a bookstore, then became a third-party marketplace, a cloud services provider. Um, you know, they do hardware with the Kindle. They do voice computing with Alexa, um, not to mention the fact that they're an Academy Award-winning movie studio and a grocer with Whole Foods. And this ability to reinvent over and over, meet the needs of the market is what's kept these companies relevant. That's what I try to go through in the book. So, but retailers don't necessarily have all those options. They're not probably going to, not going to offer a, a cloud hosting company that's going to actually be propping up the retail division as is the case with Amazon at the moment. Um, you know, what do they do? And oftentimes they don't have, in fact, we did a, a lot of research on, we interviewed uh, 650 tech executives a year ago and are about to reprise that survey. And they know they need to use AI. You know, 82% said they know they need to use AI and they're not using it mm -hmm. because they don't have the expertise or they don't trust it. They don't trust the AI. I, how do you deal with that when you, when you know you need yeah. to change? but you really don't know how to go about changing. Absolutely. Well, I need to stand on the table here and say that <laughs> any retailer or any company who says I can't do what Amazon does, um, you know, it's just a mentality and that's wrong. Um, there are many things that you can, you can, um, you know, uh, take from Amazon and put into practice in your own business. And the thing that you're talking about, how they're like, I just don't know how I'm afraid. These are the, the barriers, right? It's all self-imposed. It's not I can't. It's not that it's impossible. It is I know. It's just that 
people seem to find ways to say, eh, it's not for us, right? Because it's more comfortable to do it. And I will say right here, I've spoken with various large retailers about ways that they can implement the culture of these big tech companies. And they might start off skeptical, um, but I think at the end of the conversation, they start bursting with ideas for how they can implement some of this well, stuff. Well, give us an idea. And, what would you do? How well, do you well, how do you promote that? Okay. So um, first things first, I don't think there's any retailer out there who says we're, we're at um, capacity in terms of new ideas, right? I think every retailer knows that the world is transforming around them. I mean, obviously the internet has been crucial. Mobile has been crucial. Now we look at the different changes that we're seeing, you know, in social media, maybe there's TikTok, you know, we see a artificial intelligence changing the game. And there are so many different, and, and of course you can use um, technology to rearrange your physical space and, and optimize your physical spaces. Mm -hmm. There are so many ideas and there are so many different ways um, that this stuff can be used in every single business. But what does it not get used? I'll say two reasons. One, and this is the most important one, management is just not open to it, right? You know, you have a lot of, um, you know, uh, dedication or, or uh, corporate speak talking about how innovation is so important. Then somebody from the lower down ranks in the company comes to, uh, you know, management or somebody higher up and says, hey, I, I, I really believe in that message. Here's what we can do. What do you think happens more often than not? They're, they're, they're told to stay in the place. So you can actually, hey, look, you're just an associate. You're just a marketing manager. You're, you know, somebody working in ops here. You know, we have the big idea people at the top who are supposed to think of these and uh, new initiatives and push them down. We'll take care of the AI. You take care of stocking the shelf. Actually, that's not how it works inside the big tech companies. It's not brilliance from Bezos and Zuckerberg and Sundar Pichai and Tim Cook that ends up pushing the needle for these companies. It's the fact that they give autonomy to folks, you know, towards the lower end of the ranks to say, hey, listen, you're closer to the customer, you're closer to new technology, you're younger, or you're, um, you know, more adept, you're spending more time, uh, you know, in areas that management is not. You're filling the gaps that we're not. And we want to listen to you. And they do. And they build the channels to bring them to, to bring the ideas to management. They listen and they actually put them in, into action. I come out and yeah, yeah I, I come out of newspapers yeah. and uh, I, mm -hmm. I came out of the editorial side and then mm -hmm. I, I had a chance to um, put the newspaper online, which is such a crazy thought. But uh, they set it up as a skunk works. They gave me mm -hmm. a little pot of money and sent me across the street with a handful of people and we built a business plan and we were supposed to compete with, with the mothership. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we were profitable within two years. So do you see that, or do you see people where they set it up as a skunk works so that you're not buried by the bureaucracy? Absolutely. I mean, this is stuff. Oh, here's a good example out of Facebook. Okay, so Facebook uh, was struggling to make the transition to mobile. We all heard year of mobile, year of mobile, and Facebook was a desktop website um, and struggled to make that move to actually adapt to. Uh, Android and iOS. Why was that the case? It was the case because um, Mark Zuckerberg was very into, you know, move fast and break things, which means they would push code every single day and change Facebook every day with the mobile app process. The idea is um, you, you push code much less frequently because Apple and Google have to review it before it goes live as an app. So what Zuckerberg had Facebook do is sort of try to circumvent the process. So they built a, the skin effectively as an app. And then the apps functioned effectively as mobile browsers, right? So you downloaded the Facebook app, you clicked one button, and next thing you know, the internet loaded, you were in a mobile browser. And this allowed them to circumvent having to get every little change approved because you would go to the mobile web to use Facebook when you were using the app. They called it the hybrid development process. Now here, you know, that all sells, sounds well and good. The only problem was the app sucked. Everybody hated that app. And uh, and they were falling behind on mobile. And the big narrative around Facebook was whether they could make it in mobile at the time, because the experience was terrible. Zuckerberg was committed to this. And, and he actually even hired engineers that were supposed to build hybrid apps, building native apps for Android and iOS um, is, is a different process. And then one day after he does Q&A with the company every week, um, and one day uh, uh, one of his employees named Corey Andreka pulls him aside and he goes, listen, Mark, he said, this way that we're building is not working. 
and you're going to lose the most important battlefield in tech if you keep at it. So why don't you give me a team? Let me build prototype native apps, show them to you. And if it's not working better, then stay with the way you're going, but at least give it a shot. Zuckerberg gave him the team, gave him the, gave him the budget. Within a few weeks, those mobile apps were already working better than the Facebook hybrid experience. And Zuckerberg changed on a dime. And he said, okay, listen, I had an idea of doing, of doing this. Um, clearly, it's not the right way to do it. Let's go with your way. And effectively, they had to pivot the entire company to a new way of development. Instead of pushing code every day, they had to push it every couple of days, which would give them less test data. But they had to stomach that, figure it out. And they had to totally change the way they recruited, going from these hybrid developers to the developers that developed natively for Android and iOS. They did it. They pulled it off. Obviously, they're a mobile company. Now they're not a desktop company. And something like 92% of all the revenue comes from mobile ads. So there you go. It's a matter of, you know, talk about skunk works, talk about experimentation within companies. If Zuckerberg said, I'm the boss, I'm the visionary, we're doing it my way. And there's a reason why I have very good logic to do it my way. And he did. Then Facebook would have been left behind. And instead, you know, they are where they are today. Not perfect by any means, but very relevant. Um, and they didn't need to be. So what uh, type of advice do you give executives today on how they can be a great leader um, mm -hmm. in this very negative time? Well, look, I think that, that um, you know, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, you know, which is where you end up having fulfillment in life. And the bottom level is, you know, that you need to eat and keep living. And the top level is self-actualization. And managers kind of have both of those. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle, but let's just focus on top and bottom. Managers have that in their hands. You know, are your employees going to be people who are going to come to work to eat? And in which case, it's the lowest level of fulfillment. And you can deliver that. And it is fulfilling in some way, right? Bring home a paycheck for the family. Or do you enable people to find their way towards self-actualization and actually help them work on, on building and inventing stuff within your company? Now, it doesn't mean you listen to every single idea and build everything you know, that folks bring to you. But I think giving people the capacity um, to actually share ideas of the way things should go, letting go of some ego that naturally comes with a manager um, and, and seeing some of these ideas from lower down, you know, come through, uh, you know, is a way that you can you can remain inventive, um, relevant, and make sure that your employees are, are living fulfilling lives. The, um, I think what it's, it's, what's interesting about this time is that with cheap money drying up, um, you know, wallets are tightening, budgets are tightening, people want to cut. In fact, even the Titans are tightening their wallets. Um, mm -hmm. You think this is a good time to focus and, and it gives you an opportunity to focus. You're not all over the place. You're doing what? You're doing one thing that you do very, very well, or you're looking to mm -hmm. innovate and focus on that and yeah. do it very well. Yeah, Which that's a great question. So I was actually on air on, on CNBC and I gave kind of... Um, Two perspectives on this. The first one I think you're referencing is it's a really good focusing time for uh, big tech companies. And by that, I mean that um, there are lots of people who've been loafing. Um, there are There is lots of unnecessary spending that goes on and, you know, very easy efficiencies to find. You know, you a lot of these tech companies have gotten kind of fat and happy and uh, and they've no longer, and they've lost their competitive edge a little bit. And um at, at, by creating this kind of leisurely culture, right? A lot of people say they're going to go to Google and retire. You know, that's not the culture you want to build. And so I think what's happened now is that um, Google Google CEO Sundar Pichai has, has done the, um, some good stuff in terms of focusing the company. People are talking to him about perks and he's like, listen, like, you know, there there's a time where it was fun to work at Google before the perks. What does that mean? It means that the best part of being at this company is building the new stuff, right? At the top of the self-actualization or the Maslow pyramid, right? And that's what should make working at Google great. The thing of like, oh, are they going to do my dry cleaning or, you know, am I going to go down this slide 17 times at lunch? You know, that's less important. And for some reason, the focus shifted. So I like that he's bringing that focus back. Now, the other side of the coin is, you know, as these companies try to become more efficient, they are scaling back their ambitions in some ways. And I think that that's a danger because what that means is the experimental projects that these companies are working on, the things that would be their invention, the things that would keep them in day one to use Bezos talk, that could go by the wayside. 
And so I think when it comes to focus and not only the tech giants, but every company dealing with this in the economy, the crucial point is let's focus, focus on the right things and make sure not to lose that inventive edge, that reinventive edge that is what keeps companies relevant um, in the economy. I'll just give you one stat. Last century, a company would last 70 years on the, on the S&P 500. Now it's something like 15 years. Yeah. So you would need three, two and a half, three, three and a half ideas, um, you know, to stay relevant uh, to, to um, sorry, you need one idea to stay relevant back then. Now you need, you know, somewhere close to and a half, three to stay relevant today um, because otherwise you'll be out in 15 years. And so the, so, I, the commitment to reinvent is just so crucial. You sort of stole my question. I was going to ask you, are they, some of them about to hit day two? Definitely. I mean, I think, I think it's quite possible for them to do that. Um, but, but I, you know, I think, I think especially like a company like Apple, I wonder about whether it's going to end up in day two, you know, they have their flagship product, the iPhone, they have accessories for the iPhone, AirPods and um, the watch, and those are doing great. What happens when we move into the next realm of uh, era of computing, right? Is that going to be augmented reality? And you know, we know we know Apple is has been developing those you know its version of augmented reality glasses for a while, and we're not seeing any progress. Is that a cultural thing? You know, I think it might be. You know, we see it in in, in Meta. Okay, they're working on that. Can they reinvent themselves into this metaverse concept? Juries out. With Google, um, I, you know, by the time this comes out, this my story on this will probably be out. But Google is doing all these different AR uh, applications. You know, you can now use your your phone and maps and move your camera around and it will point you to ATMs or, um, or, you know, different cafes, train stations. Um, does, does that become a, a, an experience that lives on somebody else's pair of augmented reality glasses or does it become an experience that lives on, you know, <laughs> I'll say it, maybe Google glass too, right? So this, they, this needed reinvention is, is in very different stages all across the tech giants. And, um, you know, I think it'll, this is a crucial moment for them and we'll see how they handle it. On the retail side, um, our chief growth officer, um, Nicholas Darvo Garneau, was the chief evangelist at Google. Uh, and he worked with retailers on on that side, uh, the, on the ad buy side. And he knows that one of the biggest problems retailers are having is, is profitability. And I think, you know, you mentioned something about laziness. It got You get lazy when you're trying to acquire customers by giving all this discounts away. You know, you're just discounting everything. And, you know, 20 off coupon here, 20 off there. And if you sign up, I mean, every week, you taught the consumer, don't hit purchase on the shopping cart. If you wait long enough, you're going to get that 10, 15, 20% uh, coupon. The other thing they've been doing is they've been promoting items that are popular and popular things tend to have been discounted. So it's not necessarily looking at margins. There's a way of using AI to automate this and make smarter decisions as a retailer so that you're not giving money away and thinking you're going to make it up in volume, you know, the old joke mm -hmm. is that it's profitability that's coming up. I think you were yeah. writing something about that in one of your pieces too recently. Right. Oh, it's just what the market is rewarding right now is profitability. I, I think a focus there uh, makes total sense. And I like the idea of using, you know, AI to, to get there. Um, there's there's multiple examples uh, that I haven't always done. One that I encountered today of companies, you know, who think they're listening to their customers, and that's actually taking them in a in a path that's detrimental until they go in a level deeper, and then they realize, oh, okay, like we actually need to change things up. So, um, I would say that you know prof profitability obviously matters. I think interrogating your assumptions is crucial, um, and then the AI. You know, I think the AI is just developing at such a rapid pace now. Like a year ago, we didn't know anything about Dolly, right? You type a prompt in and now you get a picture. Facebook just uh, announced that it has, um, it's called make a, make a movie or make a video or something where you type a prompt in and it will make a five second video based on your prompt, totally generated by AI. And then we see things like Lambda, right? Which is Google's chatbot. I had the, uh, um, the engineer who believed it was sentient, Blake Lemoyne, on my podcast, that was a fun discussion. But we're really at the point where AI is fooling Google engineers into thinking it's a person. And how does this trickle down into the retail organization? Well, I think the pace of innovation is so fast that um, you know companies that succeed will have people who are constantly evaluating the new solutions, testing them out, putting them in sandboxes, and eventually 
putting them into production. And I think that you can end up doing maybe 10 years of, of work in, in one, just getting the right solution in place. And that's what I think makes this work interesting and exciting. Sounds good. Listen, I know you have to run and you've been a terrific guest. I really appreciate your time today, Alex. And to all of you listening, please rate and subscribe to the Ecom Edge on your favorite podcast streaming platform. I'm Diane Burley. Have a good one. 